All right. We have Jarrett Reddick here, lead singer of Bowling for Soup. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. <laughs> How's it going? And it's going great. You know, everything's good. It's a really busy summer after a, um, you know, I don't want to say not busy. I mean, the quarantine thing, I managed to really keep myself busy doing a lot of shows from here at my house and um, writing, recording and all that. So it wasn't just a time of nothingness for me, but it definitely was not a time of like insane travel. Uh, and now I'm back to that. So yeah, it's 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 really busy time right now. But you know, I'm feeling good about it. Everything's going great. Shows are going great. You know, music is doing well, and so can't really ask for anything more than that. That's amazing. So we read that uh, Bowling for Soup. The name was actually inspired by a Steve Martin sketch. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah, he's writing a book called Bowling for Shit. And so yeah, that that was sort of like the working title. We were all big stand up comedy fans, especially me and our original drummer Lance, um, who played in the band the first three or four years. He left just once we started touring. It, it was it was amicable. He he just touring wasn't for him. But he and I were the foundation of this whole thing at the beginning, and we both just really big into stand up comedy. Yeah, I speak movie quote. I speak stand up comedian. Like most everything I say comes from something. I you know I'll say something ridiculous at least once a day. My wife will go, okay, what's that from again? Right. So yeah, Bowling for Shit, Steve Martin uh, thing. We started in um, June of 94. We played our first show in July of 94. and We had our first album out by September. We went pretty quick. I mean, we weren't really starting from scratch, though. We were sort of the combination of two bands that broke up around the same time in a pretty small town. So it was very organic. We, we kind of borrowed some songs from those, those bands that we were in before. One of the benefits, I think, of, of our career was is, is nothing really ever exploded for us. You think back to uh, the first big hit, which is Girl the Bad Guys Want. You and I were talking about that yep. earlier. We had been together nine years and all nine years we had been in a van, you know, and again on a tour bus the first time 10 years in, you know, you're not really, there's no, no real opportunity to become spoiled. <laughs> so, yeah. and it was sort of like that in all aspects, you know, even from like building crowds and uh, going into different countries and all of it just sort of happened on a just a really nice steady climb. Fortunately for us, you know, we we really never became I don't think we really ever oversaturated people and I also don't feel like there was no real dramatic fall for us. By the time, you know, we got to pop punk being nostalgia, we're kind of still working on stuff, you know, so yeah. it's it's uh it worked out really good. For us, this whole, you know, bounce back of pop punk isn't like oh let's get back together kind of thing it's like we never stopped we've been going about it and and you know keeping it keeping it going yeah i mean you basically answered this question already but like what was your favorite part about being at the forefront of like this is pop punk and then on top of it with the grammy nomination for yeah. girl bad guys want you know it's it's funny when you look at like all of the bands you'd sort of consider you know, the ambassadors, I guess, from this genre, it's like, we really weren't, most of us really weren't from where it all started. Newfound Glory is from Florida, we're from Texas, and some's from Canada. And those California bands had such an advantage because there were bands that sounded like them where they lived. But for us, you know, and especially, you know, 94 to, to 2000, 2001, really, there was nothing that sounded like us around. We left our hometown and came to Dallas. And at least then you could sort of blend in with a few other things that didn't sound like anything, you know, yeah. I don't really think it registered for us that it was like that we were part of a whole movement until later in life. Like, I think it was sort of after a few hits and after, you know, a few festivals. And then after that next generation started to come up and go, oh, I bought a guitar because I heard this song from you or whatever. And then it was like, OK, this is weird. Right. Um, looking back on it now, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, it's like, oh, OK, well, we were, you know, one of the first bands that crossed over to pop radio or, or whatever. But yeah, the Grammy thing was huge. I mean, the Grammy thing really for us, honestly, it was kind of that thing where you could tell your grandparents about it and they like finally were like, oh, okay. So this thing you do, it's like an actual thing, you know? Yeah. Otherwise, you know, they would kind of come see us in some place, you know, in Oklahoma where my grandparents live or whatever. And there'd be 40 people there and they it, not really understanding why a dude that, is married with a little baby at home has been doing this for 10 years, you know? And then the other aspect of the Grammy is it's like a doctorate. Like we're never not going to be Grammy nominated bowling for suit. Like your male, when you get a doctorate is doctor you, you know, we're Grammy nominated us. And that good thing about it is that you don't even have to win. 
you know, because it's right. such a big deal to get nominated, <laughs> right? Yeah. So we lost and uh, it's still on the resume. The downside of it is I thought, okay, well, like now we got nominated for one, we'll be in consideration forever, you know, but uh, I guess that's not how it works. Right. You're from a small town. So in Texas, I don't know. I grew up in Pennsylvania. Did you guys have the scene? Like, was the scene a thing or were you? No, we didn't. That's what was hard about it was there was no scene. I mean, Dallas had a music scene, but it wasn't like what there was in like Seattle, you know, or, or, you know, LA or those things where like bands are, are banding together to throw shows. And, you know, you just, you know, you're all like in this whole world together. It was really like the music scene was being driven by the live music venues. And we were just a part, we were just in line. We actually got our, our biggest, you know, sort of breaks from a live band standpoint and from like a, like a crowd in Dallas from opening up for rap rock bands that kind of came off the whole Limp Biscuit thing because they thought we were funny. Most bands didn't fit with them and we didn't really either, but we would get up there and just be silly and do jokes. And they, and you know, the other big thing for us is, staffs always loved us so like we were every bartender's favorite band every door door guy's favorite band we were like every club owner's favorite band that came to their club yeah we got on a a lot of things where it'd be like you know you don't necessarily fit this but there's going to be 1100 people in here so we're just going to put you in it and i sort of liked being thrown into situations where the first instinct of the audience was to hate us (laughs) and then (laughs) just because I loved for the 90% of the time, by the time we left the stage, everybody had a smile on their face and you knew they were all coming back again. Yeah. And um, I loved that challenge. I don't really like that anymore. I mean, if, if, uh, if we go to a place and people hate us, obviously like something's wrong because people are supposed to come and see us now because um, that's just the way of the world. <laughs> But yeah, it's not necessarily a scene. I mean, there were little pockets of bands and things like that and bands that we got to be friends with, but nothing like what we read about. It's funny. We compare careers with Less Than Jake a lot. We're very similar with Less Than Jake. We're we're about the same age. Um, We like the same things. We're just, we're, we're just a very, very similar group of guys. (laughs) It's funny. I'll just be like, man, well, you guys haven't made, cause you know, fat Mike. And they're like, you haven't made, you were on the radio. And I'm like, yeah, but you got this and you got this. And it's like, I guess we all sort of from the outside looking in are always like, well, man, it sucks that we're not a part of that group, but I guess you can't cover everything. I liked where we ended up, you know, it's kind of like us and Simple Plan playing at a bunch of radio shows with a bunch of bands that played a track. We'd be the only guys that had merch, you know, the only guys that had drums, you know, we made a go of it. Had a lot of fun. I love it. That's great. So what do you think of uh, the industry right now? Like, I mean, you said it, you guys started in 94, you know, with streaming services, with everything. How do you feel about that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, there's people that have differing opinions. I personally think that the whole touring band thing is over, or at least is on hold. You know, I don't think that there's a real reason for bands who are a regional type band to go and play out, you know, hours and hours and hours away from their house. I think that's a waste of money and a waste of resources, unless the circumstances are your training shows with another band or whatever. But yeah. what I compare that to is we would get in our van and leave for like six months and we play to nobody. But, you know, these clubs had bands all the time. So clubs don't have bands for discovery anymore. You don't just go, hey, on Friday night, this place has five bands. Let's go watch. You go out to see what it is you want to go see. And then you go back home and you get back on the internet. It's just a really, really different place. Uh, The job of a musician is different, you know, just like the job of any entertainer. I have a bit of jealousy, you know, like I wish I could have been Motley Crue and you just like put out an album and then you just like your job is to go play songs and then drink a lot. But now we have to take pictures of our breakfast and, you know, put that out. And we have to, you know, there's certain things that are that you have to do and i like it i mean i think that it that the 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 music consumer is who's benefiting from all of this you're your own program director now there's no genre lines anymore it doesn't matter if you like rage against the machine bowling for soup and cradle of filth and motionless and white it doesn't matter you know that your two favorite bands don't have anything to do with one another back in the day it's like you know you hung out with the people that had the same hair as you and the same shirt And now it doesn't matter. It's interesting to try to navigate. There's no real answer. I'm actually in a conversation with my management right now of like, I've got all this stuff that's just stacked up. Let's put this stuff out there. Well, we need to make sure that we do all this right and do this and this and this. And I'm not really sure that we live in a world where we need to wait anymore. Just put that shit out there. Let's go. 
you know, yeah. I think that, you know, we come from a, from a world of, of, of albums and I don't necessarily think that the album is the best way for bands to, to exist anymore. I think singles and EPs are, are, are make more, much more sense because of attention spans. I like streaming stuff. I like the, the Spotify's of the world and the, yeah. the, I have them all. I have Apple music. <laughs> I have prime. I have like, I, right. I have Pandora, like everything. It's just yeah. like, there's, I have a different use for each one of them. I'm happy that you guys have steadily stayed with us. You know what I mean? I, I love that. Yeah. You know, we got to be self-sufficient in 2009 because we got dropped from our label. That is an interesting time to sort of like not be on a label and then have to become self-sufficient. And then now all of these things exist. Like we make our own videos and we make our own this, we record our own albums and all that. So we were sort of already doing that, you know, as the technology caught up. That's been a big advantage, I think, for us to be able to, we can operate under a lot less budget than we would have had we stayed on that label. Right, right. Now, you're sort of, uh, you yourself are sort of a mini celebrity, even outside of Bowling for Soup. Um, yeah. So how did you land the Phineas and Ferb theme song? Was there an audition <laughs> process for Disney? What, you know, can you talk about that for a little bit? I thought there would be, um, you know, I had been sort of up and down the interworkings of Disney uh, doing things, um, trying to get theme songs here and there. I'd been told no a bunch. We had already done Jimmy Neutron. Uh, so we sort of had that in our, in our back pocket. The Phineas and Ferb guys, Dan and Swampy created the show and they knew that they wanted Bowling for Soup. Like it was just, we're getting Bowling for Soup. It was all sort of just set up. So when I went to that meeting, it really wasn't, it was more of just like an introduction into like, hey, you know, here's this opportunity for you that you're never going to be able to say no to, which is kind of the coolest thing ever. Like you have this if you want it. So I got to see episodes of the show really early. You know, we really hit it off. Uh, those guys and I still stay in touch. Anything Bowling for Soup does, Dan sends me a text and comments, you know, just He's still a huge fan. I do some stuff with Swampy's charity every every year. So they're just really gracious. And I'm so happy with the success of that show. And it's been a big deal for Bowling vs. Soup. I mean, it really has. We, it's still in our live show every night. And people yeah. just absolutely go nuts every single that's, night. That's so awesome. I can imagine just being in a crowd with that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's um, nostalgia factor, you know. Grown people circle pitting to a song <laughs> written for a children's show. Yeah. And uh, yep. it happens every night. That's great. <laughs> Was that writing process, I'm sure you had some restrictions, but was that all you guys? They had the 30 second song written that's the actual theme song, but they wanted it written into a two and a half to three minute radio single. Yeah. <clears throat> and so I took their song and made made it into a verse and then wrote a chorus for it. They had some input as far as like some of the lyrical stuff and all of that, but really, no, it was really quick. I mean, I wrote most of it on the limo on the way back to my hotel not my limo disney's limo um but uh, right. they sent me uh in the car on the way back and i'd already sort of had like notes that i took in the thing and i already i had a guitar in my room and so i sort of already hummed all of it into the world it's called today is going to be a great day but my version was actually called uh today is going to be the best day ever this could possibly be the best day ever yeah. uh it's the best day ever was the tagline. And the head of the network actually said, you should just change that to today is going to be a great day. I was like, oh, I don't like that as much. And then I did it. And I was like, well, that's why he's the head of the network. Uh, Cause that <laughs> is great. right. So, yeah. I'm definitely one that gives credit where credit was due. And I'd never try to take credit that isn't mine. So yeah. that isn't my line. And uh, it's a very important line. <laughs> and so I like to think that I inspired it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. But uh, but that's not me. Okay, so you have multiple side projects. You've done Phineas and Ferb. You are also the voice of Chuck E. Cheese. Yes. Is that the weirdest gig you've ever had? Or are there other it, things that we don't know about? Um, I don't know about weird. I mean, it's a super nostalgic thing for me. I mean, I've done probably some musical stuff that you'd be surprised that I'm in or that I wrote. But Chuck E. is by far the biggest. And I was a huge Chuck E. Cheese kid. We had showbiz in the town that I lived in, but in uh, but Chuck E. Cheese was where my grandma lived, and I always liked Chuck E. Cheese better. Yeah, and I always got to go at least twice when I was with my grandma. I just loved it so much. I can still see it, smell it, hear it, just oh, yeah. all that. I, I love that place so much. So when the gig came up, it was like uh, it was because I was doing improv comedy in Dallas. The guy who got the account 
to be the new uh, advertising and to rebrand Chuck E. Cheese, he pitched me and, and made a reel. I basically went into what I thought was the audition and I was already working. I never auditioned. I just had the job. I guess it was just one of those things like this is just the guy. So I feel very fortunate for that. The same thing happened with Sonic the Hedgehog. It's exactly the same thing. The guy just came to me and goes, we want you to do this. And I was just like, okay. And it's another huge thing. I mean, especially in, you know, in other countries, the song that I did for them is huge. It's just one of those crazy things. That's so cool. It's almost like it's a testament to your talent, first of all. But like right place, right time. And just to the accomplishments of my band, you know, like I'm really lucky that I have the bandmates that I have that have allowed me to do what I want to do. They just trust me and they just go with it. In 1996, you know, a couple of years in when we decided to really go for this, part of the deal was like I just needed them to trust me and to pretty much just let me do whatever I want. And they just do that. I'm also a major workaholic. I mean, we haven't even touched on everything that I do. And the reason is because I don't have any hobbies. I just like creating things. I love making people smile. I like putting out things into the world. And if I'm not with my family, then I'd rather just be in the studio or filming something or, you know, I'm to the point in my career where I've like stopped doing things because they're not fun for me anymore. You know, like I was directing videos for 10 years and now I'm just like, I don't like that anymore. Like I I just (laughs) don't do it. You know, I don't produce other bands anymore. I don't like it. You know, it's like, it just takes too much time, you know? So it's like, I'll pre-produce a band every once in a while, which is basically, I I just take their songs and tell them how to make them better. (laughs) And then, you know, and then and they'll go, oh my God, this you were right. You know, I never moved to LA or New York. So I live in Dallas and the cost of living isn't crazy here, yeah. you know, and so I can keep doing what I want to do and make enough to support my family. And that's really what's important. Absolutely. Yeah. And so speaking of creating, um, you have a country album out now. I, I messaged you this the other day. It's like had yeah. me in feels because I grew up in Pittsburgh. My mom like had me grow up on country music. It was Alan Jackson, Brooks and Dunn, George Strait. In high school, I switch over to all this pop punk emo stuff. So I feel like kind of, I don't know, a little bit of kindred spirits here. (laughs) That's a real easy transition. You know, it's, it's funny. I've said this so much because, you know, the album came out in March. I've done a lot of press on it. Like, what, what is the deal? Like, what, how do you jump from punk rock, pop punk to country? I'm like, they're the same thing. Like it, it's, it's all simple arrangements, simple chords you know, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, either a bridge or a guitar solo, yeah. chorus out. I grew up listening to country too. Bowling for Soup songs are stories. I tell stories yeah. in Bowling for Soup songs, you know. Yeah. Debbie just hit the wall. Her name is Nona. She's a rocker with the nose <laughs> ring. You know? Those could just as easily be in country songs. I've always had a passion for country. I have a Waylon and Willie tattoo on my arm, which I say on the album. I would want to do something in it, but I didn't really know to what capacity. Yeah. And it took sort of a few other side bands that I've done through the years to know that like, I don't think I really want to do the band thing again. And I don't want to do it as Bowling for Soup, though I think that would be fun, but it would have just been a novelty. And yeah. I, I I really wanted to mean it. So yeah, I was able to put this out. And my friend, Zach Malloy, who's in a band called the Nixons, and he's a songwriter in Nashville, really just kind of lit the fire and just said, dude, we got to do this. You've been talking about it too long and we've got this opportunity during quarantine. And it's cool because I got to say a bunch of stuff on there that I probably wouldn't say in Bowling for Soup. There's a lot of Bowling for Soup songs, as you know, with feeling in them, but I always try to make it to where it's not too heavy. But in, in this record, I was able to to really get a lot of that out there. So cool. Um, so the album is called Just Woke Up. And you actually, to your point, you actually have some original Bowling for Soup songs on there that are country iterations. Yeah. And one of my favorites is Ohio, Come Back to Texas. I honestly, yeah. I loved it as Bowling for Soup. I love it even more as a country song. Like it just works so well, you know? Yeah, thank you. That's the other thing about Bowling for Soup songs is they're all written on acoustic guitar. And when I first write them, they sound like country songs and it's really after you put the drums and the octave guitar and I snarl my voice a little bit, write it up, up, up into a higher pitched area where it starts to sound like pop punk. But I really wanted to keep this album like super organic and simple. And so the two Bowling for Soup songs, I wanted to bridge the gap. I knew there would be like a whole bunch of Bowling for Soup fans that were like, oh, I hate country. And it'd be like, do you? Because this is how I play this song. When you come pay money to see me acoustic, I play it like that. Right. 
and you seem to kind of like it, you know? <laughs> so it's worked in my favor several times where people are just like, uh, okay, you got me. This is great. But I also understand that not everybody's going to come over to that side of things. And I, I'm, I'm willing to, to work at it and, and find, you know, who my audience is going to be there. Yeah, definitely. You mentioned uh, one of my favorite lyrics is the fact you're watching the Steelers lose and your wife is berating you for watching, you know, uh, something yeah. lines. And now- yeah, I, got, uh, I got two Steelers references on the album. One of them is when I, my, the girl, it's called Dog on It. The tagline is she's got the leash and I'm the dog gone dog on it. It says she shushes me when I'm barking because the Steelers lose. That's right. Yeah. And then, no, I guess the other one is actually uh, on the new Bowling for Soup album, which I've put Steelers in a bunch of stuff on the Bowling for Soup stuff. But I have on the new album, I have one that says uh, if I could change things in my past, maybe I would have, uh, learned a second language or um, bet on the Steelers in the 09 Super Bowl, you know? Uh, <laughs> and it. so, uh, but yeah, I, I tend to try and get those kind of things out there all yeah. the time. Yeah. It's really funny. Again, just full circle here. I'm from Pittsburgh, PA. Yeah. I, I heart Steelers fan, Penguins, Pirates, like grew up there, moved to New York, E-bombs world, bowling for soup. And you're just like, Dropping Steelers references left and right. <laughs> yeah. Well, my dad's from Pittsburgh. He's from the uh, from the South Side. We all saw the news yesterday that Heinz Field now has the worst name <laughs> in the world ever. Uh, I'm not going to hate on it because I just <laughs> tend to, I tend to try and be positive about everything. But like yeah. the Pittsburgh Steelers uh, posted our new name of our stadium is such and such, and I put I'm in the market for a huge ketchup bottle that pours when a touchdown is scored. Anybody know where I could find one of those? Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, that's so good. Did you grow up a Steelers fan? Or were you just uh Yeah, I grew up a Steelers fan. Yeah, it's pretty easy. I was I was born in 72. We we won four Super Bowls. Yeah. You know, that that we beat the Cowboys in 78, which is, you know, I was six years old and 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 you know, everybody else around me liked the Cowboys. So, you yeah. know, like most musicians, you know, once I found heavy metal, I sort of stopped paying attention to anything else in the world. And then, you know, you become an adult and you start to pay attention to stuff again. So I just picked right up where I left off as far as my fandom is concerned. And the whole upstairs of my house is framed jerseys and memorabilia. And my favorite player of all time is Jack Lambert. I was just on tour with the Aquabats and uh, the Bat Commander is a Steelers fan as well. So we we had a lot of fun talking about talking about Steelers. I'm actually wearing a Steelers shirt right now. I love it. Oh my God. (laughs) <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> you guys used to tour with Punchline too, right? Used to tour with Punchline a lot. Still talk to yeah. Chris uh, Fafafalos a lot. Yeah. Uh, oh, oh, those guys. I love seeing them in, back in Pittsburgh. Great band. Uh, I think their album 37 Everywhere is so great. Oh, um, just really love those guys. Well, all right, man. I mean, unless there's anything else you want to spitfire about i mean this was i feel like we covered a lot but this has been so great man thank you for having me oh my god thank you guys for doing this honestly this was a blessing i would never say that i've never used that word but (laughs) this is incredible give everybody there our love and uh talk to you soon sounds good we'll see you jared